Okay, so last time we talked about um, non th uh, things that are going to cause our earth pressures to not meet the classical earth pressure um, limit states that, that we had discussed, Coulomb, Rankin, and the log spiral. But that was all having to do with rigid walls, that, that is walls that translated rigidly. Today we're going to talk about um, th the same issues, but about, about uh, non-classical earth pressures that come from the fact that walls aren't rigid, they're actually flexible. Some walls are more flexible than others, and we get into the design, you'll understand that. Um, and we're going to cover that first, and then I'm going to go into a set of guidelines which combines uh, the design guidelines that are in the FHWA manual with some other design guidelines that I've developed, and I think it'll be helpful for you. So that's what's on the docket for today. So um, this, the, this one's pretty straightforward. I want you to be able to um, describe it particularly why, when it, when it comes to the, the flexibility, the, the characteristic that walls are actually flexible, how that affects the earth pressure theories and why the limited equilibrium methods don't necessarily apply to those. And then there's a special concept of called an apparent earth pressure diagram, which we won't completely cover today. Uh, we're going to cover that when we get into braced excavations, because it's the design method we use for that. But, but the concept of it you should understand, and we're going to touch on the concept of that today. So the simplest way to do this, to look at this, is with just a, a little example. So if we have a rigid cantilevered, it's a cantilevered retaining wall. So it, it, there's no supports to it. Um, this whole, we're going to assume this whole piece acts like a rigidly. You've got part of it that's embedded in the ground here, and then you've got the part that's above. So this is a classic cantilevered retaining wall. We use them all the time. Um, and if, uh, if the wall translates as a rigid body, we're going to obviously develop, develop active pressures on the back side, assuming it moves far enough. And then on the front side, we're going to develop passive pressures. And assuming we have enough displacement to, mo to, to, um, to uh, mobilize all the passive pressures, we'll have a full passive uh, triangular envelope on the front, and we'll have a full active envelope on the back. And we saw yesterday from the lab data, if we get enough displacement, we get pretty close to these conditions, right? Well, that's not what actually happens if we have a flexible wall. If you, and if you want to think about flexible wall, all walls are flexible to some extent, but if you think about a sheet pile wall, if you're familiar with sheet piles, they're, very quite, they're quite flexible. So if we look at a flexible wall, and this is a figure out of your manual, um, it, this would be the, this would be the Coulomb envelope that, that, that you would have behind the wall. Uh, and This black line here represents the actual earth pressures on the wall. And let's use, and this is our deflected wall shape. So this is a wall that we've installed in the ground and then started to excavate behind. So this is a, this is a cut system. So this is a cut wall system. Now let's, let's start from the bottom up. If we don't have any, if, if we've installed this wall and there's no deflection, then there shouldn't be any lateral earth pressures, right? I mean, there'll be lateral earth pressure on the left and the right, but they should cancel out and there, and there, there essentially is no net lateral earth pressure. So that makes sense. And if we go to the top, if we have enough displacement, we know near the top that we should be able to get to the active uh, condition. And in between, and, and so notice that at the top, it's going to reach the active condition. They've drawn this active envelope a little, little below there, but I think that was just to show it. It'll reach the active condition near the top, but at some point behind it, it's, it's no longer going to be at the active condition. Why? Well, there's not enough displacement to get to it, or it's, it's not a you know, we're going to have that non-classical earth pressure that we talked about anyway. And then we're not going to get it in the, your, your passive envelope might look something like this. We're going to start to mobilize maybe near the full passive capacity right, right near the bottom of the excavation where there's, where there's a fair amount of displacement. 
But after a while, there's less and less displacement. We're not going to be able to mobilize. We're not going to be able to mobilize that much. And then the walls actually, you can't you can't tell in this displacement. There's actually going to be an inflection point here where the wall bends back the other direction, and you're going to mobilize a little bit of passive resistance on the front side of the wall. And eventually, there's going to be no displacement and no load. And that's clearly not classical earth pressure conditions. And it's all because of the displacements that's going on. We're not, we're not getting enough displacement to reach our, our active and passive conditions. To complicate things anymore, let's talk about an anchored wall. So this is a cut wall where we've, and you generally you excavate down to some level, and then you're going to install your anchor. Your anchor is going to go back here behind the wall someplace and be anchored. And then you're going to, you're going to pull on that anchor, and generally speaking, you're going to put two loads on it. The first thing you're going to load that anchor, you're going to load that anchor to P equals 120% of the design load. And you do that because you want to make sure that it can actually hold the design load. And then you'll back that off after you've tested it and ensure it's OK. You're going to back that off to 75% of the design load. And we'll talk more about this when we get to anchors. But I just you need to understand the process here. So. What's, what's going to happen to this wall? Well, if this is, uh, this is our K-naught conditions, here's our passive envelope. So this is, this is the, the, the passive envelope. That means our active envelope is going to be a little, a little bit more down here. Well, as we start to excavate down to this point and the wall moves, we're going to generate, we're going to, we're going to reach, where's my, there it is. We're initially going to reach something here along the, that's, that's along the active envelope as we start to excavate down, it moves at the top. And so this, this, when we get down to this point, this curve is again is going to look something like this for our earth pressures. But then what's going to happen, we're going to come in here and put an anchor, and we're going to push really, really hard on the wall there. Or we're going to pull from the back. Which, you know, if, if, if it's a brace excavation, we're going to push on it. If it's an anchor, we're going to pull. But we're going to put, be putting a really large horizontal force there. How big a horizontal force can I put on there? What's the maximum I can get to, theoretically? What's the maximum stress I can get behind there? Assuming, that the, assuming the anchor doesn't pull out, and assuming I don't break the, break the anchor, When's the soil going to fail? When I get to the passive, right? So here's my passive envelope. I didn't draw that very carefully. So here's my passive envelope. So when I, when I load this thing up to 120% of the design load, I'm going to get a really high earth pressure back there. Why? Because I'm pushing into the wall. I won't quite get the passive. We usually don't get that far, but that's the farthest I could go. And then when we back off, we, then we back off, we're going to have some lower load. That's this, this is the, um, this is the earth pressure you're going to have for 75% um, of the design load. But you're still going to have a, a, an earth pressure there that's much higher than your active condition. Why? Because you pulled, you, you displaced the wall in, into the soil. So when we get to a brace, I mean, we, we get to uh, an excavation that's either braced or anchored, we're clearly not going to have anything like our um, earth pressure um, conditions that we that we have uh, for classical earth pressure. We're, we're not, we're not going to get to the active and passive, passive case. Those will still be limiting cases. We can't get more than the passive case, and we're not going to get less than the active case. But we're generally, we're going to be someplace in between those, and there's a lot of space in between those. So uh, this is an example of the, the loads you might see in a brace excavation where you've got two different, uh, they say anchors here, but they could be anchors or could be braces. Near the surface, you're going to come down here at something that's like the, this is going to be like the active condition. But then where you put your, where you put your anchors, you're gonna, you can get above that area, and they could go below that area farther down, and you're going to put another anchor. And so you're going to have an earth. You're going to, your actual earth pressure diagram is going to look something like that. 
Well, that's really hard to design for, and we're not going to design for the actual earth pressure diagram. In fact, we're not even going to try and figure out what the actual earth pressure diagram is. We're going to use something that are called apparent earth pressure diagrams. We'll discuss these more when we get to anchors. But these, these are apparent earth pressure envelopes. And it's important that you understand the word that those are envelopes. These aren't the actual earth pressure on the wall. What these are are envelopes where, where through a little bit of theory and a lot of empiricism and a lot of field measurements, we're confident that the loads in the anchors or the loads in the struts are going to be less than or equal to those. So what that means is, and, and this envelope kind of shows it, this envelope, if this is my earth pressure envelope, notice that most of the earth pressures, they may exceed it a little bit, but the, pretty much we know that the earth pressures are going to be less than that envelope. So if I was to go to a site, let's do this one I have it marked on, if I was to go to a bunch of excavations where I had a single anchor like this, and I plotted the loads that I'd seen in, in uh, anchors in those systems, I should see very few that are outside this envelope, and most of them are in here. So it's a design envelope that we use to determine the required forces in our anchors and our struts. It's not an earth pressure envelope. It's an apparent earth, I mean, it's not an earth pressure diagram. It is not the loads that we expect to have on the wall. It's an envelope that should, will, include, that will include the majority of the, the loads that we expect to see in our anchor systems. And we'll cover that more later. The, more, the more important thing for you to understand right now is this is an earth pressure envelope, not a theoretical earth pressure. It's an, it's an envelope of possible loads in the wall, in the wall support system. So let's just do a, a quick summary here. This is a very short module. Um, so when it comes to uh, braced or strutted walls, so walls that are braced or tied I should say, or, or tiebacks. The, cla the classical earth pressure solutions are not, not appropriate. Why aren't they appropriate? Why don't we see the classical earth pressure diagrams? What's happening that's getting us some earth pressure that's different than the classical diagrams? Well, from, from, Tuesday's, from, Tuesday, from the, the data we looked at in Tuesday's labs, what was required to reach the, the classical active and passive cases for, the, for the, the walls we looked at? Displacement. And when you have flexible systems and you have tiebacks or braces, your displacements are going to be very, very different than you're going to get from a rigid wall. So you should always have, you're always going to have pressures that are between, you know, your, your actual horizontal pressure is going to be less than, um, it's going to be greater than K A, greater than or equal to Ka times, and write this again, sigma Z times Ka will be less than or equal to K, uh, sigma uh, X, which will be less than or equal to sigma Z, these should be primes, Kp. It's got to be between the active and the passive. But where it is between those is going to depend on the displacements. And when you have flexible walls and you're doing things like loading them, you're going to be changing the earth pressures behind them. So we use empirical uh, design uh, to, to we use empirical designs to determine the stress distributions. Or the other way that you can do it, and these and, and these empirical designs, these are the earth pressure envelopes. These are the earth pressure envelopes. Or the other thing you can do is do a finite element method where you actually have a stress strain uh, um, model for your soil. And so when you apply loads or displacements, you'll strain the soil and you'll get stresses in the soil based on the model you use. So those are the two ways you can do this. And, and the finite element method is becoming more and more um, uh, approachable. Um, it has been, it's probably only been in the last five years the point was actually getting where it's usable and in 
in some more typical designs. It's for, for many, many years, it's been really only usable by experts uh, that do nothing but that kind of modeling, because it's very, there's some issues with it. So it's important that you understand the difference between the earth pressure envelopes and you understand why we're not going to get our classical earth pressures. And I think that's it for this module. So.